everybody, and welcome to a brand new spoiler review episode of Ahsoka here from the Geek Buddies! <gasps> hey! Okay, okay, good. Uh, we're back at it again uh, this week talking about Ahsoka. So much happened in this episode. Of course, coming out of episode five, we were really spoiled by Dave Filoni in that episode. Everyone going crazy for that episode, talking that it's peak Star Wars. So how do you follow up an episode that incredible and, uh, I don't know, universe changing and Star Wars changing? Well, you follow it up with a, an episode that goes back to the beginning, goes back to the lore, talks about the mythology and pushes the boundaries out of Star Wars uh, than, uh, more than we've ever seen. And you bring uh, into live action these two characters that people have been waiting to see, Thrawn and Ezra. And again, this is a spoiler review. So if you haven't watched the episode, <laughs> don't watch it. Come out. Come back and hang out with us because we're going to be spoiling the heck out of this episode for sure but let's introduce ourselves first i am the outlaw john roker writer producer and host here on the geek buddies i am michael vogel writer and producer of animated tv shows and movies and this is shannon mcclung i'm a television actor and an animation writer where you can see the third season of strawberry shortcake Barry in the big city uh on youtube right now new episodes drop every saturday Nice, nice. Get on it, people. Get on it. I wonder if we're going to get some Night Sisters, Night Berries. Are we going to get some Night Berries in that down the road, maybe? some. Uh, <laughs> I'm just throwing it out there, you know. Some uh, some bad berries, man. Don't eat them. They give you some visions. It's uh, You can go you can go on a go eight-hour trip if you take those Night Berries. <laughs> it would be on Beridia? hey oh, I mean, I'm just hey! saying. Hey! hey! <laughs> Shannon, Shannon better watch out. His position is in question with uh, with some golden nuggets like that. Come on, Barry. I, br for... I bring one thing to the writer's room, and Johnny's nipping at my heels no, right no, now. No, I would never. I would never. <laughs> um, I got enough on my plate. All right, so the way we're going to talk about this whole uh, episode. We're going to break it down into four sections. There was a lot to dive into for sure, so I'm going to give broad strokes. For those who may be new to the show, taking a chance on our review show, Usually I give the broad strokes of a scene and then Michael and Shannon chime in and, and me after them with our thoughts on the scene overall. So that's how it works. But we like to start off initially with our overall thoughts. So, Michael, please, your overall thoughts far, far away, directed by Jennifer Getzinger, written by Dave Filoni here, diving into everything that happened in this episode. Please, what's your overall impression? I mean, it was a hell of an episode. A lot mm. happened. I I loved it. Uh, I I loved it, but the have okay. asterisk. Okay. Um this episode particularly is very much a if you are a Star Wars, Clone Wars, Star Wars Rebels watcher, yeah, you're all in. It's yep. great. It's great start. This is peak Star Wars, loving every minute of it. Have a couple questions, but overall, like just really loving it. But this was also the episode where, given the way that they introduced Thrawn and Ezra, mm. um, and the maybe a little bit of lack of context into what exactly has been going on for the past decade on Peridia. Yeah. I feel like if you didn't watch the show Rebels, uh, I don't know that these introductions had the impact that they had for the rest of us. Like, this is definitely one of those times where it's like, I think that if you are a hardcore Star Wars fan, you had one feeling, and if yeah. you've just been watching Ahsoka and kind of catching up and it's all broadly made sense, I think the way that these two showed up, you were kind of like, okay. Hmm. All right. Um, but that being said, overall, I love there was a newness and a freshness to this, like literally going to another galaxy yeah. uh, made things feel wild. Like we who, who what's going on? What's happening next? Who knows what's going on? Like we got a lot of visuals that we've never seen before in Star hmm. Wars, like seeing a giant star destroyer that's kind of in ruins and half made out of gold and stormtroopers that have been really run through it over the past decade, like yeah. brand new aliens. Like they're just, there was such a feeling of adventure to this episode that just kind of made it thrilling. Like it, it really does feel like we're on the edge of the galaxy and anything could happen. Well, great points, Mike. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I've heard that from a number of corners as I've seen people's reactions uh on social media and other places how like if you haven't watched rebels if you haven't watched clone wars this is the one episode where you might not feel the emotional impact of what was being led up to here and what we got in this episode a valid uh complaint as well and yeah for me it was it's the nice mixture of samurai stuff with arthurian stuff with lord of the Rings stuff really interesting um themes and uh, vibes in general 
overall feeling slamming into itself to create this new area of a galaxy. Shannon, your thoughts overall on what we got here in this episode? I mean, super, super enjoyed it. Was so curious what the other side of the galaxy, other side of this, you know, separate galaxy, what it was going to look like. Um, and it looks like some stuff we've seen in our galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> I did like the I did like the ruins. A lot of the production design I thought was super, super cool. I mean, how these stormtroopers are literally held together with uh, uh, tape and bubble gum in the in the form of red ribbon and night sister magic. I and, thought really and gold cool. and gold. Right. And gold. A lot of gold. And gold. Um, yeah, I just thought the production design was just incredible. And uh, Lars Mikkelsen, you know, he did voice the character on yeah. Rebels. That guy has such a chilling voice. Mm -hmm. um, and seeing him in live action, seeing those piercing red eyes, I mean, it was just super, super satisfying. And I was convinced, I'm like, you know, we're not going to see him until... Until the last minute, maybe we'll get him in the the second or last episode. But because, but he did play such a prominent role in this one. Um, I do agree that there is maybe a lack of context for folks, mm. and I think they have a vehicle to to give you some of that exposition in Shin Hati, um, as she is a as a younger character, and uh, Balin Skull could deliver some could deliver some exposition to her that would make sense. Um, there was one moment that I'm like, man, I really feel like you fumbled the ball here. Mm. Uh, but okay. we will we will get to it when we get to it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I like this episode. It's a good episode to follow up that last episode with. It's much more layered, much, I'm sorry, much more grounded, much more foundational. We're not going off into the weird areas, but still the magical stuff is there. The dark magic stuff is there. So seeing that kind of thing I thought was really cool to see. But also... We know Thrawn. We know the machinations of Thrawn. So for all his intelligence, he is very much like everyone is expendable as long as I get what I want. And I think seeing Lars Mikkelsen's portrayal of Thrawn in live action versus over the microphone, it was a really interesting and overwhelming and unsettling to see how he handles his business and how close Morgan Elsbeth comes from getting, I mean, Morgan Ellsworth is like, uh, what's his face from Goodfellas, who keeps hassling Robert De Niro for his money? Morty, he's like this. You don't know how close Morgan is coming to dying every single time she questions anything that Thrawn is doing. And I remember that, and uh, specifically that moment where he sends out two squads, and she's like, shouldn't we send more? And he's like, look, we've been out here in exile for a while. This is what we have to spare. And so you see, like, there's a moment where everybody's expendable to Thrawn, except for the Night Mothers, in his effort to get out of this galaxy. Uh, and Michael, you mentioned gold. Shannon, you mentioned putting things together and how they're held together. Kintsugi is the practice, the Japanese practice, of weaving broken things back together using a gold to fill in some of the pieces. And that's what this vibe felt like when you were looking at the pictures of Enoch and the pictures of the Night Troopers and the shots of them that, and, and the Chimera itself. It felt like this had been shattered and broken and we don't know if these not if these night troopers are actually real troopers or something else so going to be some questions that'll be answered over the next two episodes for sure but let's get into the episode let's break it down i'm going to break it into four sections as i said the first section is pretty short i just wanted to get the guy's thoughts on this particular scene and then moving on to the rest of the episode we start off with the pergil taking us through intergalactic travel and this is gorgeous Damn beautiful, really peaceful and quiet. Hu Yang and Ahsoka are talking about the history of the galaxy, parts one, two, and three. She says she prefers part one. Uh, Hu Yang asks if she has a story, and she tells him that Sabine went with Balin and the others willingly. She sensed that from the star map. A star map. Hu, Hu Yang doesn't initially accept this, but Ahsoka says she saw it through the Force map uh, and uh, through the Force with the map. Ahsoka says Sabine could have ended this. No Thrawn, no war. And Hu Yang says yes and no Ezra. And Ahsoka laments that she did not have enough, enough time to prepare her to make the right decision, which essentially implies prepared her to make the decision I would have made. And Hu Yang drops another pearl wisdom, saying the Force can provide one with insight, but it does not provide all the answers. Maybe in Sabine's mind, it was the only choice she could make. Ahsoka gives him the look, a choice she made for herself. And Hu Yang says, that is your fear. And Ahsoka wants to hear a story now, and it begins as all great Star Wars stories do a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So let's start there. Michael, this is the only sh uh, scene we have with Ahsoka in the whole episode here, but it's an interesting back and forth because when we came out of episode five, it's Ahsoka the White, and she's embracing, she's much more caring, she's embracing everybody, she's much more caring, she's got more knowledge and more perspective about Sabine, but here she is once again complaining that Sabine had a chance to end this thing and didn't do it. So maybe not as 
developed as we anticipated or maybe not as um i don't know maybe she hasn't overcome these issues quite 100 percent as we as we thought so what were your thoughts about this scene between hu yang and ahsoka that's well, good look i mean i i'm all about ahsoka the white i don't think we want ahsoka the white to be uh uh so knowledgeable and perfect that she's not interesting anymore so mm. i think i'm glad that she's still questioning some things and that she and sabine haven't worked stuff out you know i right. think we are getting close to the end we got two more episodes left and i think one of the big things that's sort of left hanging over everything is yeah. we have everyone is talking around sabine and ahsoka a whole whole lot and we still don't really know what went down with these two right, right. um and i would hope that we find that out. I hope we get some context there. But <laughs> I do think that this question of trusting Sabine seems to come up a lot. And Sabine trusting Ahsoka. That, yeah. that there's a lot, there's a little bit of a lack of trust here on both sides. Uh Balen Skull brought it up with Sabine. Um, you know, your master didn't trust you, uh, and that led to your family being killed. And now here we are again with Ahsoka kind of being like, I, you know, I don't know she made the right decision. And to me, what Hu Yang was saying, you know, there's, there's just all of this talk about fate and destiny and mm. things happening, how they happen. And it seems that Ahsoka really just wishes that had she been able to train Sabine a little bit more in the Force, had been able to give her a little bit of a deeper knowledge as a Jedi, she would have abandoned Ezra for the greater good. And Hu Yang is kind of saying, or maybe she wouldn't have. Yeah. Like maybe this is the only choice she can make. And then when Ahsoka says for her, and he's like, that's your fear that, that Ahsoka's afraid that this is a selfish choice, uh, right. a dark side choice, a choice that is putting this guy above everyone else and like going down this dark road. And I don't know that that's what it is. You know, I think, I think that's, what's going to be interesting is Sabine's choice to go after Ezra and Ahsoka and Sabine's issues. It does feel like this is all coming to a head where whatever this, once Ahsoka catches up with everybody, I really do hope that, as much as I hope that we get two episodes chock full of epic Star Wars action, I kind of also hope that we get a lot of explanations and uh, and some come to Jesus moments with these characters. Um, in addition to all that, and this kind of runs throughout the episode, I love that with Peridia and the talk of Peridia and this conversation they have, the characters in Star Wars are talking about a place the way that we talk about Star Wars. Mm, like for us, yeah, Star Wars, is a thing that happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And Star Wars is so ingrained in our culture that it is now our folklore and our mythology and our fairy tales. You know, the epic story of Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader and this rebellion in a far off galaxy. And now with Hu Yang talking about their history and Balin Skull talking about the folklore of Peridia, they are now talking about their universe and this and this other galaxy in the way that we talk about it. So Hu Yang busting out a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, like it hit me just right. Like that's a thing that could be cheesy. Some people maybe thought it was cheesy, but it hit me right in the sweet spot. And I was like, man, I loved it. And then seeing Far, Far Away coming up as the name of the episode, I was like, yep, okay, Filoni, I'm with you. I'm with you, buddy. Yeah, this felt Shannon like this is his a little bit of his homage to George Lucas and having this back and forth with uh, Sabine and Hu Yang talking about how she prefers part one. Like, is she saying that she prefers the Phantom Menace as a meta way because that's the birth of Anakin and Anakin getting into uh, getting into it uh, becoming a Padawan? Or is she saying part one like a new hope, which is a lot of people's favorite a thing or is she talking about you know the first story which of course is going to lead us to what Balin is talking about later on in the episode about the beginning of this whole thing this whole pattern so a lot of illusions here throughout in the back and forth here with Sabine and Hu Yang talking about oh sorry with Ahsoka and uh, Hu Yang talking about Sabine's decision and whether it was the right one what do you think of this opening scene man I mean, whether it she was talking about the prequels, the original trilogy, <laughs> we, we know which one she wasn't talking about. <laughs> um, no, I really like the. I, I really enjoyed the scene. I mean, one, I think the the serenity of traveling through oh, hyperspace God, yes. on a star whale. Um, it's just so. It's so calm. It's so peaceful. It's so zen, and it's juxtaposed later in the episode so brilliantly when they come out in the ring ship, and it's just so chaotic and it, you know there are these we've seen ships come out of hyperspace and they don't do that i mean to sort of demonstrate how far they've actually traveled yeah. um no i thought that was really really nice and even who yang who is a droid who's lived you know twenty five thousand years or however long and he's like you know traveling through in a hyperspace and a star whale now i now i really have done it all like <laughs> i think who yang is sort of the unsung hero hero 
of this show mm. um uns- uh, uh, for not just in the story but also in the storytelling um in that you get a lot of good information out of Hu Yang and when you look at who Ahsoka could have gone with on this journey mm. it seems like Hu Yang again for the storytelling Hu Yang was the absolute right right choice like is there a version where Hera went with her totally but Ahsoka having to go to someone for counsel this is just the perfect this is just the perfect choice um and yeah I mean even though uh, Ahsoka might be a little more elevated than before um after you know meeting Anakin in the world world beyond worlds um yeah she's still gonna have that doubt especially because she finds out about Sabine after that's happened yeah um after after her sort of resurrection so the fact that one she didn't share that with another one of Sabine's with friends her. that she's keep, yeah. she's playing that close to the vest um I thought that was all great and and Hu Yang saying that you know you the force gives you insight, but it doesn't give you everything. Um, And, you know, hopefully what we're going to find out is that Sabine didn't just make the choice for selfish reasons, that there was more to it. Like we've seen her not really be able to wield the force, but maybe just not in a way that we're used to. Yeah. It's just, it's tough for me a little bit. And I'll say this because like Ahsoka, I mean, she, when presented with the chance to kill all the droids in order 66, as we saw at the end of clone war season seven, she adjusts. She doesn't kill them. She does. She does try to keep them alive. Why? Because she loves them because she cares about them. So to me, it seems odd that she would have an issue with Sabine caring about Ezra and loving Ezra and, and doing these, these things to save Ezra. So for me, it's just a bit inconsistent. And I, and I like you, Michael, I have to see what the source of their, division is so i can put things in proper context but for right now i just have some questions about why she has an issue with it i I mean other than thrawn obviously well yeah but i mean i think that and again like just to contextualize it Mm. and i you i i think she's ultimately wrong like i do think going after as is probably the right thing so i'm not disagreeing with you but i think in terms of what she's saying is the difference is you know, killing a bunch of clones who are trying to kill you or not killing a bunch of clones who are trying to kill you is a very That's a choice in that moment. Mm -hmm. The choice with Ezra is we need to leave this alone because we just got through a seven year war, I believe. Mm -hmm. Like, I Mm -hmm. think like a new hope to Jedi is about seven years. We just got through a seven year war after an empire that rose up for about Mm -hmm. a generation and killed billions of people. And we are just coming out of it. And if this guy comes back, Mm -hmm. we might be back in it. It's not worth it for one person. Right. Which is easy to say when it's not your person, right? As right. we saw with Captain America and Bucky. But let's not open those wounds again. Either way, let's move on. The Eye of Scion. We cut to the Eye of Scion coming out, as Shannon said, out of hyperspace. Sabine and Balin have an exchange about their deal for Ezra. Later, Balin uh, is on the bridge of uh, the Eye of Scion here with uh, Morgan Elsbeth, And they're talking about Sabine. He says she could be of use. They arrive at Peridia, the ancient home of Morgan Elsbeth's ancestors, the Dathomiri, Morgan informs them that her night sister brethren were the first to ride the Pergil and travel intergalactically. I hope that's a word. Balin says Perdia is the end of the migration route, and we see like these bones of the whales there in space, the Pergil floating, which is a really unsettling situation there. Uh, and they all head to the planet with Sabine in tow. The planet, as we mentioned, has massive sculptures. We head to a temple that's very similar to the ruins we saw on Setos. Uh, the temp- there are three cloaked night sisters there with orbs forming a red triangle. Uh, looking up the Easter eggs, they are called Atropau, Clothau, and Lexis, which are riffs on the names of the three sisters of fate in Greek mythology, Atropos, Clotho, and Lachesis. The great mothers tell Morgan that Thrawn is coming and that she must be patient. And they smell a Jedi and they look to Sabine and they say it's dangerous. Then they use their spheres to put Sabine in a cell below the temple. Now, the night sisters, for those of you who don't know, are a cult of force with that of force that they use force powers with magic uh because it and it's unusual because it originates in another galaxy so where they kicked out uh what's the whole story about them being on peridia so there's some questions there the ship leaves uh they're uh leaving balen shinhati and morgan uh on uh there on the planet on the ruins there on the planet and morgan's off doing her own thing shin and balen have a conversation about the old stories and the legends and about power uh, Balin schools her that the Thrawn power that uh, Shinhati is excited about is fleeting, and Balin reveals that he wants to stop the pattern 
of the fall of the Jedi and rise of the Empire. And I say the music here is fantastic. And to me, I'm like, what is he talking about? He wants to go back to the beginning to end it all. Is this connecting up to the James Mangold movie? So very interesting stuff here. Then we get the third psych out of the series of Sabine using her powers on the door, rumbling. Is it happening? No, it isn't. It's the Chimera Thrawn Star Destroyer. It descends upon the temple. We see these night troopers lined with Enoch barking out orders, and there is Thrawn. I wrote, this is Nazi-level type shit, as we've seen before in Star Wars. The music here is great. It's like old-school 1960s, 1970s horror vibes. And just like that, he speaks. What was first just a dream has become a frightening reality for those who may oppose us. He salutes the Great Mothers. He introduces them to Enoch. The Great Mothers mention Sabine, who they describe as a loose thread. Thrawn, almost like Macbeth says, you three witches didn't mention that this was a fly in the ointment. What's the deal? What's the information? Balin offers up that he brought Sabine, and Thrawn knows him as General Balin Skull of the Jedi Order, and uh, Balin says, I left that a long time ago, and he says, you would not be the first. Then Morgan offers up Sabine's name, and Thrawn says, now there is a familiar name, and that you could be right. She will be of use to us. So, Shannon, a lot here to dive into with this conversation between Balin and Shin Hati there at the temple about the old school tales and what he's really doing there, a little more mystery. He talks about the Jedi Order, everything burning down, and then then throw the appearance of Thrawn. So, big stuff. Please take it away. What are your thoughts? This section I just absolutely loved. Mm-hmm. Again, the the chaotic reentry that they have when they get to Peridia, yeah. um, just the crackling in energy around the ship. It was just so just yeah. Again, it just sort of demonstrates the the effort involved in getting to this place to get Thrawn, uh, which I thought was just so so cool. Um, you we're kind of seeing a different Balin. I mean, what made him really interesting was that he did have this code of honor, but we're going to find out like, oh, is this, are you a details guy? Do I have to be very, very specific with what I say in my deals for mm-hmm. the deals to actually follow through? Because I, it, it doesn't shock me that Sabine is in a cell, that she, Sabine is in manacles in a cell. It's like, yeah, we have this deal. We're going to get you. You're going to be reunited with your friend for the time being. You have tried to kill us a couple of times. So we're going to let you, we're going to let you cool your jets in this cell right here. But the moment she says we had a deal, and there's an expression on Balin's face. I'm like, we've not seen that before. And it was sort of like a grim satisfaction that I was like, Ooh, Oh, what, Balin, what's what's happened? What's happening here? Um, watching them go down into the planet, and you see the condensation building up on the windshield. Like those are just details that I love to see. Mm. Um, and seeing that giant statue of that night sister as they're as they're kind of coming in, and you see like it, it's interesting that they're like you know this was once this great this great kingdom. It seems pretty desolate. Like it doesn't seem like it's been ravaged. It just seems like it's not that inhabited. Like you do have these. You do have these giant statues and you do have this landing platform. But other than that, it doesn't seem like something bad has happened here. It just seems like it's just not a very populated world. Um, getting to see the Night Mothers in live action. Again, that's a, that that's a, just a, a really, really fun thing to see for someone that watched and enjoyed, enjoyed the Clone Wars. And it's one of those things like you don't know how it's going to translate to live action. Like there have been some characters in the past that didn't really translate to the to to the satisfaction of some of the fandom i think these these three 100 percent did. like they just they look good they look otherworldly but it's not too far um the way that they speak much like the witches in Macbeth, i was like oh this is this is a lot of fun and it was interesting how they're like it it reeks of jedi and it's kind of like okay you're talking about sabine but again sabine hasn't really demonstrated any sort of force aptitude but i'm like are you actually talking about Balin and Shin? Um, which I thought was interesting. Them taking her down into the cell, kind of you know being faced with the uh, reality of her choices. Like, boy, this this may have been a bad idea. Love the sec- Love the scene between Shin and Balin, where we're getting a little bit more about what Balin has actually gone through and what Balin actually wants. Mm. Him saying that they're. Uh, there is something here that is calling to him and he is he is presuming that shin can actually feel it too and it also kind of addresses the sequel trilogies like 
this happens again and again and again. Mm -hmm. One is up, then it's the other, then it's the other, then it's the other. We want to, it reminded me of that speech that uh, Daenerys had in Game of Thrones. Like, I want to break the wheel. Break the wheel. This this one being on top and that one being on top. Um, Thrawn's entrance was just, freaking awesome i mean the 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 force fake out i thought for sure like yeah i don't think this is the moment <laughs> and that's a, that's a lot of movement for someone that's not been able to successfully do this yet but seeing the chimera like you know in all its glory but seeing how it's missing panels like the things that they've had to do to survive i thought was just so so satisfying and you see all those all the stormtroopers lined up again just being held together with scotch tape and bubble gum <laughs> yeah. but they still look very intimidating and like enoch i was like the the design of that helmet like mm. that is that reminds me of like something you'd see in like a gladiator a gladiator story like that looks so so cool and the moment that thrawn just opens his mouth again you just get chills down the back of your spine it is just so reptilian and even though the night mothers are the ones that's have kind of uh, brokered this deal. Um, the moment that he looks at them, when he finds out that there was a there's a prisoner, he's like, "He didn't tell me about that." Like that, you can see him recalculating in his head how uh, he, he's just he, he's just a machine. The gears are always moving and always adjusting. Love the interaction between him and Balin uh, because even though Balin is a new character to us, having Thrawn know who he is that kind of gives him some history that mm. gives him some weight. Um, yeah, I was just such a big fan of this section. Like this will be the episode that I go back and watch again and again because of Lars Mikkelsen. Yeah. I mean, this is like a steak, like you're just really got to take your time and enjoy this thing as it, you know, finishes cooking as it sits there and the juice is soaking. There's a lot to get out of rewatching this episode for sure. I've watched it three times now in preparation for our review because it's just such an easy episode to watch and such a fantastic episode to watch. And this section here, Mike, what are your thoughts here of what we get with Balin and Shin Hati? Balin, as Shannon said, wanting to break the wheel in essence and wanting to make these changes here. And that's the power. It isn't the world between worlds. It's something bigger than that that he senses here. And then, of course, the appearance of Thrawn and the Night Sisters. Um, well, Thrawn certainly looked like he's enjoyed quite a few steaks while he's. Oh my Korea. god. So that wow. there's that. Um, <laughs> Hello. I mean, oh. listen. Let's look. I agree with everything everybody said. I'm about to get into it, but like we can yeah. all agree that you know Thrawn, a man who uh, who had kept in pretty good shape with his uh, with his uh, regime as the uh, Grand uh, Grand, Grand Admiral. Admiral. Yeah. Uh, maybe he's uh, been a little bit more lax on Peridia in the past decade. Let's just let's just take it easy. There's not um, a whole lot to do there, Mike. I mean... Well, that gets to one of my issues, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, overall, to Shannon's point, like, like just a note about world building mm. and what I think Filoni did so well in animation and he's continuing to do so well is when you have a brand like Star Wars that has a certain level of iconography in its visuals and its vibe and its feel, um, we always want something new, but we also want something new that feels like something old. Mm. And so comparing some of what we saw in this episode to say like Force Awakens, where Force Awakens, the first order is kind of the empire and yeah. Starkiller base is basically the Death Star. <laughs> but with this episode, even like the Eye of Scion, like in the prequel trilogy where George Lucas introduced this idea of ships that had to go into a circular thing to go into hyperspace and then could detach and go do what they needed to do and had to come back to the big circular thing. Right. Um, and so the Eye of Scion being just a giant version of that. It's taking something we've seen, but giving us something new. Um, the night, Seeing the Night Sisters fully realized, but then seeing these huge statues and this epic iconography, mm. and then seeing the Chimera, seeing a Star Destroyer, as Shannon said, that's really been through it, but like covered in gold plating and seeing stormtroopers that have gold in everywhere. And then Enoch, just as a character, it's like, it's stormtroopers, but it's stormtroopers in a way we've never quite seen them before. So I think throughout all of this, this episode really just, at, at least on the visual side, epitomizes what I think they're doing 100% right with this, which is 
this feels like Star Wars. This is the yeah. big mythology. Let's get into the weird shit mysticism Star Wars. And it's giving us all the things that feel like Star Wars, but it's all tweaked a little bit. It's a little bit different. So I think that's been really, really fun. Um, Night Sisters are awesome. Love it. Love to have them here. Keep them around. They're great. They can just <laughs> hang out behind Thrawn all the way into the Heir to the Empire movie and just like be... <laughs> be saying weird witchy shit and I'm here for it. Like I am a hundred percent in, um, the reveal of Thrawn and the Chimera just from a visual standpoint is as you guys both said, just perfect. Yeah. Like just this giant star destroyer kind of enveloping this already giant tower yeah. and then all of them coming out, standing at attention. Like it was a great reveal of Thrawn. Um, and every, yes, everything you guys said about him knowing Balin Skull, referring to him as general, just those little bits of context that make you go, okay, there's history here is great. My one thing, and it really, I gets into more of when we get to the Ezra reveal, but I okay. think this is where it starts to, the only issue I have is, and this is where I think you solve for this issue of people who don't already know Thrawn and don't already know Ezra, mm. is that there's no explanation of what's been happening for the past decade. Like there's no explanation of why are these stormtroopers all right held together with uh, bubble gum and and scotch tape. You know why did the Chimera? I I don't think it was the naughty. I don't think it was those little crabs <laughs> that really busted the Chimera up. So you know like there's like visually we're getting the sense that they've really been through some stuff. Mm -hmm. But and Thrawn's entrance is great. But as soon as we get past it, some context of like what's been going on on Peridia, A, would have been just really interesting, but I think it would also would have been an opportunity for people who don't know Thrawn to yeah. see just how smart and what a great strategist he's been. He's like, we've been dealing with this. And it would have also contextualized Ezra a little bit. And so we get a lot of really cool visuals and this great intro re introduction and live action of this character. But I think it for all that it looks cool, we just dive right back into, okay, now let's get out of here. And yeah. I think there's a lot of stuff that was left on the table a little bit that really would have fleshed things out, filled it out a little bit more, and done some really nice character work for people who were just catching up. Yeah, um, Mike, go, so go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh no, no, finish your points. Finish your points, brother. Well, no, I was just gonna say on. So that's that's how I feel about all that. Yeah. I I loved the the Balin Shinhadi scene. Like I mm. like again, just this idea of them talking about the folklore and mythology in this galaxy, the way that we refer to the Star Wars galaxy and Balin kind of being like, I'm done with it. Yeah. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to do this over and over and over. I want to step outside of this whole thing. Like let's, let's, let's break this apart and destroy everything. So something else happens. Like this is the big MacGuffin of the series. Like mm. he keeps referring to this thing on Peridia that's going to allow him to do this. And it's clearly not part of Thrawn's plan. And so this is where, all of our villains, and we said this, I think every week, all seem to have their own kind of thing going on, but they've been moving in the same direction. And in these next two episodes is where I think all of a sudden, like villains are gonna start moving in different directions yeah. and it's gonna really cause some interesting things. Um, but I really just dig it. I really am fascinated by the fact that Shin Hadi does not like witches. Yeah, <laughs> that's a big she deal. Keeps, it, it keeps coming back, more witches, it's witches. She witch? Witches. Okay, something's going on. Either she's a really big fan of Wicked or she – So I don't know what it is, but, like, there is something going on there. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that – most. Oh, and the only other thing I'll say is thank God Ezra was in this episode so we didn't have to go with an entire week of people saying that Enoch was Ezra. Uh <laughs> like I swear to God, I saw Enoch and I'm like, if Ezra is not in this goddamn episode, we are gonna be right back at Merrick and like every screen crush and heavy spoilers and everybody else will be like, all these videos, Enoch is Ezra. What really happened with Thrawn and Ezra? Oh, here it is. And I was like, as soon as Ezra showed up, I'm like, thank God. <laughs> As you can see here, Enoch is clearly Isra. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, I liked this section. It was my best uh, Australian. No, I, I like this section a lot. There's so much, as you said, Michael in the world building. And uh, Shannon, I think you make an excellent point to address Michael's points, this idea that you could have used the Shin Hati uh, Balin vehicle to have this conversation because she clearly mentions Thrawn and says the power of Thrawn, aligning ourselves with Thrawn. And he just says the, that power is fleeting. 
Balin could have said, and here's why. He's been out here all this time. He's been doing this. This has been happening here on Peridia, talking to Morgan. She told me this and revealed this. So there could have been some fleshing out for the people who haven't watched uh, uh, Rebels or Clone Wars or read the Thrawn books, either the Zons or the Ascendancy ones. Like those, we, we could have, uh, there could have been more fleshed out here mm -hmm. and there wasn't. So absolutely, I think that's a fair point. Uh, and it's tough sometimes to see that when you're, when you have, kind of good knowledge of a certain person and they show up you're caught up with like how great it is and how cool it is to see it but yeah there's more here yeah i like this and i and i really enjoy the conversation with balin and shin hati because you know i'm older and and i remember being young and thirsting for power and wanting that kind of power so you see that shin hati is just clearly from a broken home clearly from some kind of beginning that isn't great and so for her when balin is talking about like the burning down. I saw everything I know burnt to the ground. Essentially, that's Order 66. And it changed me. It, it, I realized, you know, at the time I didn't understand, but as I got older, I understood. And that's the difference, right? He's older than her. So Shin is focused on any semblance of power because she's had almost no power or control of her life. Whereas Balin has had that power and control already, and he's gone through that to the other side to realize that it's all fleeting. It's all a joke. If you don't, as Shannon said, break the wheel. And so his drive is different. When you get older, you see different things in your systems and the way things have been created in our world. You see the holes and the fallacy and the lies. And later, um, you know, she's going to ask about the Jedi Order and he's going to say essentially the same thing. I miss the idea of it, but I don't miss the weakness of it and the lies right. within it. And so there's a power here in what Balin is doing and exposing. His, his cause is almost noble. Even though he's maybe using ignoble ways to get there, you can understand why he's doing the things. And I love that back and forth with him and, and Shin because he is trying to guide her. And, of course, he says later, which we'll get to, I want you to be something other than a Jedi, better than a Jedi. And that's clearly what he's driven to do. You know, And a lot of people feel that way in the world. We see that in our world today. People want to break a system because they're tired of it repeating over and over and over again uh, these same things. Um, I do want to say two things. First of all, the Night Troopers... There have been people who made the speculation, I give this credit to Screen Rant, uh, that the name sounds very similar to Death Troopers, which is, which is one that's already been used in canon, but in Legends, referring to zombie stormtroopers. So they may be borrowing that and turning these uh, troopers into zombie stormtroopers. And Enoch is an interesting name because it comes from the Torah. He was a man in the days before Noah and the Flood who was so devout and holy in the eyes of God that God took him directly to heaven instead of making him experience death first. So... He's never experienced dead or he's undead. I don't know. But it's a really interesting character, Enoch. And God sent a purgle down. He hopped in and he was off to heaven. <laughs> peace. Peace, bitches. All right. Well, let's take a quick break. And then we'll jump into the rest of the episode here right after this. Bum, 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 bum. Boo, do, do, do. That's good stuff, man. That is good stuff. All right, this one's going to be a little bit quicker. So Sabine and Thrawn. Sabine is brought before Thrawn, and they have a fantastic exchange about her singular focus to find Ezra reshaping the galaxy. He will honor the deal, give her a mount, provisions, and intel on Ezra. He says, though, once his starship departs, she'll be stranded here forever, and that Ezra might be dead. And she says, if you survive, I'm sure Ezra is fine. He says, you gambled the fate of your galaxy on that belief, and she calls him out saying that, you know, you wouldn't understand. Of course you don't get it because you wouldn't. Uh, and then we cut to her mount, and it's a howler. And we first saw howlers in Star Wars uh, Jedi Knight, those games there. They're native to Yavin 4, but we see it here. And Enoch, strangely, in my opinion, warns her of the nomads in the wasteland, gives her her weapons, and tells her to die well. So just an interesting, why would he warn her about all of this if he knows later, as we find out, he's going to be tasked with killing her. So interesting. She takes her. It's Ezra. Huh? It's because Ezra. it's Ezra. It's um, Ezra. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, it's Ezra. She takes off into the <laughs> wasteland. Thrawn is watching from above and tells Balin to follow her close. And as soon as she finds Ezra to kill them both, we cut to Sabine on the wasteland using her tracker. It's shot out of her hand, and she has a cool fight scene with these samurai-looking nomads. If you pay attention, it's very samurai reminiscent in terms of their armor, and eventually defeats them when she whips out her lightsaber. We cut to Shin and Balin going after her. Enoch updates Thrawn about them, and Thrawn orders two squads to go after them. And as I said, Morgan questions Thrawn about this, says we should send more, and Thrawn pauses says their numbers have dwindled since their exile and shut the fuck up. He makes it clear that his objective is to escape the galaxy 
and F everybody else. And this, to me, is the seed that might be used to turn Shin Hati and Balin into allies, an uncomfortable alliance with Ezra and Sabine to survive this whole situation. We will see. Um, Sabine and her howler have a fun exchange about it, running away. It's really sweet, like old school Star Wars here. Then the howler, who is initially grabbing some water, smells something, licks a rock, and out comes what people have described a crab person or, or a crab creature or a turtle creature, but it is a Nati. We've never seen these before, the Nati. Sabine and the Nati connect over the Rebel Alliance logo. More Nazis are called out. They have a conference amongst themselves, and they have Sabine and the Howler follow them, follow them, essentially implying that they're heading towards Ezra. So let's stop there. Mikey, your thoughts on all this that we get here with uh, Sabine and Ezra, they're back, or Sabine and... Um, uh, 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 Thrawn and they're back and forth. Then what goes on with Thrawn saying everybody's expendable? I got to get out of this galaxy. And then later with uh, uh, Sabine and uh, her fight, and then with the Howler and the Naughty. Um, the Sabine and Thrawn scene I thought was excellent, mainly yeah. because it's a really tough thing to do. Where like these characters have interacted in the past. If you watch the animation, you've yes, seen it, yes. you've done it, and they brought them back together. And it's written in that way that like. There's a lot of subtext to what they're saying, yeah. but also there's nothing that's confusing. Like, it's not like Thrawn's like, remember that time? And she's like, yeah, but there was also that time. Like, they don't do any of that. Like, it's very much like these two have a history. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was just really well done, really well performed, really well acted. Dug all of it. I fucking love Howlers. <laughs> they nailed it with these creatures. Like, they, like, just the, the, the work on these creatures the performance of the creature, the vibe of it, the way they run, like it just, it looks so cool. Like, and it is, this is, this is that old school. You know, I was, I got in this argument with somebody who was like, oh, I thought the, the Howler and the Naughty were a little, you know, cutesy wootsy. And I was like, have you watched Star Wars? <laughs> like part of what made Star Wars so amazing when it came out in 77 is so much of sci-fi was so sort of very serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so putting things like C-3PO and R2, Jawas, like, you know, let the Wookiee win, like all of these little bits and pieces, that that kind of silliness, that kind of fun is what kind of made Star Wars stand out. So yep. everything with Sabine and the Howler was just to me, I was like, this is this is the little kid in me is loving this and wants to go buy a Howler action figure now. Like that is <laughs> they just nailed it all the way. Um, the Naughty. Where you know it literally was like the trolls from Frozen and Sebastian the Crab had children, <laughs> and that again it was giving me full like Leia and Wicket vibes, like this was fully Ooh, like yeah. this is Leia meeting the Ewoks for the first time, except it's Sabine and these little creatures, and it again it just felt they did it felt so alien, it felt so weird, it felt like something I had never quite seen before, and I was like I was instantly sort of and then the interactions between Sabine's Howler and the Naughty, like mm. it was all just adorable fun and I was eating every little bit of it up. Um, and then to your point, John, to sort of like balance that out with, you know, the Morgan, Elsbeth and Thrawn and like the bigger like, mm. Thrawn's like, sure, sure, like keep your word. She will find him and then you'll kill him. It's cool. But then also, but like, but then it's also you're seeing, and I, again, I wish we had gotten a little bit more of Thrawn's um, military genius. Like the uh, whole, fair. I really want to get home. I don't really want to spend the troops to get them. Yeah. That's secondary. This is my primary thing. All makes sense. All valid. All kind of in keeping with who Thrawn is. But we didn't, it's kind of like we've seen so many Batman movies where Batman was smart, but they didn't really play into he's the brilliant detective. Mm. And only more recently with Matt Reeves and some other stuff, have they really gotten into a, no, he's like super smart. And I think that was the same here. Like Thrawn is good. Everything's great. Lars Mikkelsen's nailing it. He's done it before. He's doing a great yeah. job. But there was an opportunity here for him to really do one of those Thrawn, let me explain to you less smart people why my brain is so brilliant and how we're doing this. And we didn't quite get that but I'm hoping we're going to get it in the next couple episodes. Um, but yeah, so everything on Peridia, like all of this stuff, like it was just, it was the right mix of arch villainy, silly aliens, adorable meetups. Like it was this, to, to, as much as Shannon like loved that previous section, which I thought was all awesome. Yeah. This was my section. Yeah. Well, of course. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense actually. Uh, Shannon, your thoughts on this section here uh, and what you, what you got out of it in these exchanges and what we see later on. 
with uh, uh, Sabine in the fight and then uh, um, uh, the naughty. I mean, I love the Sabine Thrawn interaction. Yeah. Watching two characters be, you know, reunited, so to speak, um, from one medium to another is is a lot of fun to watch. And I think both um, Natasha Liu Bordizzo and Lars Mikkelsen played that really well. Yeah. Um, the fact that, like, yeah, I know you, I remember you. You're you're a pain <laughs> in my ass. Um, and uh, Sabine's genuine surprise, like you're just gonna you're just gonna let me go, and he's just like, yeah, you help my cause, I'm gonna help yours. And he's thinking, sure, absolutely, go 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 find this other guy who's kind of a pain in my ass. And if you <laughs> you know if we can get rid of both of you at the same time, fantastic. If somehow you make it back, we got some hostages <laughs> coming back into the galaxy that we know. Win 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 win. <laughs> After after uh, Sabine leaves and Thrawn tells Balin that like, hey, so yeah, go, go, you know, at your own pace, go and follow him and you know, take him out. And Shin, we know Shin doesn't like witches and we yeah. know that Shin is a little um, taken aback by the uh, cracks in her mentor's foundation. Yeah. Where she says, you don't mean to you don't mean to honor the deal like, you know, Shin doesn't like Sabine. Yeah. <laughs> She's tried to kill her several times. But the fact that it's it's less about Sabine and it's more about Balin. Mm -hmm. And like you're you you've taught me a certain way. You are going back on some of those teachings right now. So it, it's it's really it's going to be interesting to see. Like for a while, it was like, oh, Balin's going to turn. It's like, yeah. ah, maybe it's going to be Shin who's going to turn. Maybe Shin's the one who's going to hop on a hop on the rebel side. I thought the how I thought the howler was perfectly cute. Um the introduction of the Nazi, it was funny because like I get the crab eyes, but I was looking at them like, oh, these are like little turtle hobbits. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> the moment that he sees the insignia with with uh with Sabine, I was like, oh okay, so this this is how we meet Ezra. Yeah. Will it be this episode? We'll find out. Um but no, I mean that whole section that whole section I really, really liked. I thought I thought it was good. Yeah, I mean, I this is I think Michael, you you nailed this is like last week everyone's like, this is Star Wars. This is what we love about this is also what we love about Star Wars. The, when you when you get it right, the mix of the foreboding dread and the stakes, and there's this real evil villain that is intimidating and unsettling as Lars Mickelson's live action interpretation of Thrawn is just as much as his uh, on the mic interpretation is. And then you have these moments where you have a character, a main character, one of the main characters, have these fun little cute moments with these creatures. That's so important to Star Wars to have the balance. That's what's always made people love Star Wars as a franchise. And I thought they absolutely nailed it in this section. And to me, on the recent series, recent months, they haven't always nailed the balance. And I felt like right. this episode really nailed the balance and I enjoyed it. And yes, Sabine and... And Thrawn back. I love Natasha Liu Bordizzo's rebellious nature. I love that she gives no quarter and she don't give a shit. Here's Thrawn, who's basically scared Morgan Elsbeth. Even Balin bows to Thrawn and she could give two shits. She's going to go toe to toe with him because she knows. You know, what did Rob Williams say to Stella Skarsgård? I knew you when you, you know, didn't know which side of the bed to piss out of when you still had zits on your face. That's kind of how now Sabine treats Thrawn. I knew you when you was a bitch, you know, this kind of thing. So he's she's got her own perception of it all. And going back at him with Ezra and digging at him with Ezra. I love that. It gives even more strength to this character that Natasha Liu is building throughout this whole uh, uh, series. So it's great to see that. And then, of course, seeing Morgan, uh, seeing a, a Thrawn do what he's doing. And Michael, you make an excellent point, man. I, I had, a, a, to be honest, I had a, I wasn't overwhelmingly like, wow, this is awesome. There was something missing from the Thrawn introduction throughout this episode. And I think what you're talking about is what I was missing. This, let me see the intelligence in work. Let me play. Let me see it in motion. Let me see what he's doing to figure this out. Why hasn't he be able, been able to find Ezra for seven or however long years they've been out here in this area of the galaxy? Why has it been an issue? When he uh, hears the name Ezra, why he didn't want to get crabs? Or something? What? What? He didn't want to get crabs. Okay. All right. But yes. Oh, 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 oh. Well, yeah, questions. I agree. But I agree. But I yeah. agree with you. I wanted more. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I just wanted more. But I think you nailed it. It's this is I didn't understand what it is that I was missing. There. But the way you said it, I think absolutely nails. So uh, when you read yeah. when you read the Heir to the Empire books, yeah. you read the more recent Timothy Zahn books like, yeah, it, it's a pretty it, it's very Sherlock Holmes in the way that they write Thrawn. You always have a character in the Heir to the Empire books. It was Captain Paleon. But you always have a character yeah, that's yeah. there. 
who off and Morgan Elsbeth, they did it. They just didn't fully. You have a character that says, what if we do this? I think this is what's going on. Right. And then you have Thrawn say, that is not what's going on. This is what's going on. And he says yeah. something ridiculous. You're like, I, I think you're wrong respectfully. And he goes, let me explain to you why you're dumb. <laughs> and then he like goes down the list and like they just that, it's wash rinse yeah. repeat with the Thrawn books like that is how Thrawn works and that Morgan Elsbeth to your point like well why don't we send out more troops it was it was almost there yeah and had she been a little bit more forceful and he had been like let's let me walk you through exactly what will happen if we do what you want to do right versus right. what I think we should do it would have it, it could have been you could have amped it up just a bit more and I think it would have given audiences who are more unfamiliar they would have gone okay yeah, I get it. This guy's really smart. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, let's take a quick break and then we'll jump into the last section uh, right after this. Do, 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 do. <laughs> That's a perfect <laughs> cue. I like that, Mark. Uh, Shannon. All right, let's move into the last section here. Balin and Shin come upon Sabine's handiwork with the Nomads. Uh, Balin tells Shin that Ezra comes from a breed of Bakken Jedi trained in the wild after the temple fell. Shin says, train like me, and Balin says, no, you are trained to be something better. As I mentioned, she asked about the Jedi Order, and if he misses it, he says he misses the idea of it, but not the truth of it, the weakness. And he sees that what once was uh, this great witch kingdom of the death, Miri, here in the wasteland, he senses it, and he thinks this is what's going to change everything that they need to do. Shin's like, we should get out of here. Thrawn's leaving. We should go. And he's like, no, maybe they're afraid of a power greater than they own they uh, their own then they see the bandits come over the hill and balin says we're going to make an unholy alliance with them to go after sabine and ezra sabine enters the naughty village she sees all the tech of the huts which is really interesting this is in essence a native village you cannot escape the connective tissue there then as she's looking around at everything and taking it all in we hear this voice from behind her out of focus and it's ezra bridger saying i knew i could count on you they have an exchange about his plan and then they hug Ezra wants how he had no plan and he just kind of did it. Uh, Ezra wants to know how she found him or how she got here. And she's like, ah, let's not talk about that now for obvious reasons. I mean, hello, Thrawn. And then Ezra tells the naughty to pack things up since they'd ever stay in one place for very long and asks Sabine to help them do that. He thanks her for coming and that he can't wait to go home. We cut to Thrawn's ship. The great mothers tell Thrawn that another Jedi is coming. He deduces that it's Ahsoka. It gives Morgan a little bit of shit for not verifying her death. Did you see the body? And trusting a flawed Jedi in Balin, he wants to know about Ahsoka's background, her history, homeworld, her master, and everything. Tells Morgan that if a star whale approaches a Pergil, Morgan must kill it with extreme prejudice, which is an Apocalypse Now line. And then he tells the great mothers that he will once again acquire the aid of their dark magic. The threat of destiny demands it, uh, Grand Admiral, they say, and the episode ends. So Shannon, Ezra, uh, 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 Balin and Shinhati again, and then this ending here with Thrawn essentially dressing down Morgan Elsbeth for not checking to see if there's a body of Ahsoka. Your thoughts? So I love every Balin Shin scene, but what I took from this, when she goes, do you miss the Jedi Order? And he says, I missed the idea of it. I immediately thought of when Harry met Sally. When I miss, I miss the, maybe I missed the idea of Helen. Helen. No, I missed the whole <laughs> Helen. That's all I can think is him saying, maybe I missed the idea of the Jedi Order. No, I miss I miss the whole Jedi <laughs> I thought that was really, really funny. <laughs> Sorry, with a fringe on top, in front of Ira. Yeah. <laughs> Going to uh, the Nazi village, I was like, again, the, in terms of production design, you know, it's not Star Wars if you don't have a diminutive alien alien species someplace. <laughs> and this is this is what we're getting for Ahsoka. And I think, you know, I think they're 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 really really fun characters. This is where I feel like they really fumbled the ball oh, emotionally okay. with the Ezra Sabine reunion. Okay. When you look at how much time has passed, where Ezra is, and the risk that Sabine took to try to find him, she's essentially risking the New Republic. It was just a little understated for my taste. <laughs> now, this has nothing to do with either of those actors' performances. This is 100% writing and direction. But to me, it's like you can have that kind of jovial back and forth. Mm -hmm. But that hug was just, hey, what's up, man? Like, so there were the stakes were so high to get here that I'm like, that to me was wholly unsatisfying and i'm like yeah. there needs to be an embrace here like i you know what i i thought you were i thought you could have been dead 
I, I, you know, I, I've thought about this for years and here it is in front of me. And again, narratively to me, this just landed like a lead balloon. And it was really a shame because I was, I was really excited to see that Ezra Sabine reunion. So this one left me very wanting. Luckily we get another Thrawn scene. <laughs> it, it brought me, it brought me back up. Um, what's interesting here. And, and, and again, this is more a question for you guys. Um, the moment that Thrawn sort of deduces like, okay, so it's Ahsoka Tano. Tell me everything. Yeah. When he asks who her master is, I'm like, I thought Thrawn knew that. Is that not, I thought Thrawn knew that Anakin, what, it, what, what Anakin was Vader and Anakin was Ahsoka Tano's master. Am I incorrect there? Cause that seemed like uh, that, that was a little bit of a speed bump. I can't imagine Filoni letting that through. If um, if absolutely, was, yeah, yeah. When when Grant when when Thrawn met Anakin Skywalker, hmm. um, I mean, having read the book, I don't know if Ahsoka was his Padawan at the time, but she's hmm. not in that story. She never okay. comes up. Like okay. Anakin is on his own. It's Anakin and R two. They're out at Batu. Uh, they're looking for Padme. Thrawn and Anakin team up, but Ahsoka never comes up. Okay. And then later, when Thrawn goes on a mission with Vader, once he is Grand Admiral, um, it's long past the time that you know he was ever with Ahsoka, yeah. and it's it's a, it's Thrawn just deducing based on things that Vader said that Vader is Anakin and kind of letting him know that he knows that. Um, so like and like Thrawn knows Padme. Thrawn right. knows that stuff, but mm -hmm. the Ahsoka part of that never quite came up. And truth be told, in Rebels, Ahsoka and Thrawn, you know, Ahsoka kind of disappears at the end of season two after her right. confrontation with Vader, and Thrawn comes in at the beginning of season three. So there's not a lot of overlap there either. So uh, I think it's within the realm of Squint Test to say that he wouldn't have necessarily known Ahsoka. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, again, still, still a great scene, even though that was a moment that I'm kind of like, ah, that's su that surprises me. That's not information that he has. But knowing that he is going back to the Night Mothers for some more dark magic, um, I did read and, and you know, this is not a, a, a revelation on like the Maroque level, but perhaps a lot of the, a lot of those night troopers have the same stuff that Maroque has that yeah. some of that night sister magic, which I okay. think if that does come to play. I think that's a really, really fun detail. Yeah, and I think that's what he meant when he said, I need more of your night, uh, dark magic, because I imagine the dark magic is what's keeping him with the illusion that he still has power and these troopers to command, in essence, uh, as long as the Night Sisters or the Great Mothers uh, let him have that power for sure. Uh, Michael, your thoughts on the Ezra reunion here with Sabine, uh, the Balin and Shin Hati conversations, mm -hmm. and this ending scene with Thrawn? Uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, I'm a Shan and any Balin Shinhadi scene is great. Like just yeah. listen to ba listening to Balin wax poetic about his thoughts on things. I, mean, yeah, I could do that for 45 minutes and probably be fine. What I particularly like about what he says, uh, particularly about do you miss the Jedi Order is they've done. There is this interesting thing in Star Wars where both heroes and villains now all have like some opinions on the fall of the Jedi, like the, mm. the Jedi Order itself was so inherently flawed and was so duped in what they did that you can have like Ahsoka walked away. Yeah. So yeah. she clearly was, you know, she walked away from the Jedi temple, but Balin gives me lots of shades of Barriss Offee from Clone Wars, the animated series who, mm -hmm. you know, framed Ahsoka and bombed the Jedi temple. But her reasons were that the Jedi were in a war and basically were working for the dark side and she wasn't wrong. And yeah. here you have Balin Skull talking about the Jedi order and, Kind of like he, the idea of it is great, but in execution, it was so flawed. And I just think it's like George Lucas doing what he did in those prequels. As much as I think the actual execution of those prequels leaves a lot to be desired, uh, the world that he built and the things that he added to the Star Wars universe are still reaping dividends. And so I thought that was really, really great. Um, I don't fully disagree with Shannon on the Ezra scene, but I also don't think it landed like a lead balloon. Like, I do think that like seeing them come back together was great. I think he he looked like daddy Ezra like he literally looks like Ezra's dad from the show and oh, also yeah. true he was yeah. and also he was kind of daddy Ezra if you know oh, what I'm saying it oh. was not bad but uh and all just like just kind of pitch perfect on kind of just his his sort of the way he spoke the way he talked I'm like yeah this is Ezra this is Ezra 10 years later like I completely accept that this is who we're getting I think that 
again, I get that they were going, and this is where I do kind of agree with Shannon. I get that they were going for like, let's kind of underplay it. Like let's kind of have him leaning against the thing waiting for and being like, I knew you'd get here in this whole scene, but it would have been great. And I don't need him and the Nazi to be in the middle of some revolution against Thrawn and the stormtroopers. But I do think that like a little bit more context of what's been going on a little bit. Cause like right now you're kind of like, okay, so you guys purgled your way to Peridia and then high fived each other. And you went off and hung out with the turtles. Like what, what's been going on. And mm. so like a little bit of context. And then the other thing that did kind of irk me is this whole him being like, so how'd you get here? What's going on? And she's like, can we just not talk about it? Can we just wait? And I get again, there's a lot of baggage to what's been going on and that he doesn't know anything about what's been happening back in their galaxy. And so there's a lot to talk about, but you kind of just don't want characters to be like, we've got so much to talk about, but let's not do it right now. Mm. You're like, okay, well that's, you know, like it would have been better if like, the naughty had been like coming in like hey we gotta go we gotta go we gotta go and there was like an actual reason where you're like okay like we're, we got we got a lot to catch up on but let's get the village moving or you know yeah. like there's ways that you can still sort of sidestep the conversation without it sort of just dropping like a thunk mm -hmm. and i do think to shannon's point I, I actually liked their reunion but i do feel like had we gotten a little bit more it would have been nice and now particularly like with these two episodes to go as i was saying earlier we mm -hmm. now have these two big chunks that you just I feel like have to be addressed. Like the Sabine Ahsoka, what happened the first time that you guys were training right. chunk. And now this, what's been going on on Peridia for 10 years? Like if mm. they just don't address it and we just keep moving, I'm gonna be like, I, I feel like it's 10 years guys. Like there's a lot of time. Um, as far as the last scene with Thrawn, um, kind of to what we were just talking about, I do think it's interesting that he brought up, you know, I wanna know about her master. Like, cause I do think the fact that he did in the novels uh, know Vader, interact with Vader, and interact with Anakin, um, if they do bring that into the story, it does make things interesting, particularly because based on episode five, you know, that's a big thing. That's a big trigger for Ahsoka. Mm. So if he does, if he is able to press on that and he is able to sort of get under her skin with that, I think that's going to be really interesting. So... As I'm, I'm hoping these next two episodes are supersized because we got a lot. We got a lot to do, you guys. We got a lot to do. <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, I'll throw in my two cents here. I absolutely think uh, the I, I agree with Shannon. I agree with you, Michael, to a degree as well. That, that this is a, it was a little bit underwhelming. The reunion of Sabine and Ezra would have been interesting, maybe to see like somebody looking through some of those Star Wars binoculars and seeing Sabine coming over the hill with the naughty. We see this hair. We don't. Is it Ezra? Is it not? So you're teasing the situation so that when he she walks or she walks there into his view, he's already prepared for it. And we know he's been preparing for it because he's seen her. Or maybe he's talking with the naughty, as you said, Michael, where they're working out something to do. And then she shows up and he looks up and there's this real. Oh, my God. After all this time, you know, and there's this real kind of sense of excitement around each other. And then this hug, which I thought the hug was nice. It held on for the right amount of time. The hug could have carried even more weight. And I'm going to tell you something. This hug had a little sexual energy. I've never felt that between Ezra and Sabine, but uh, this in live action, I sensed a little something here. So now I'm kind of in the ballpark and the idea of that maybe there's some unrequited love here, unspoken bonds between the two that may be driving this whole thing as well. So who knows? I may be wrong, but just I sense that when I was watching those those sequences. Love Balin and Shin having this conversation. Shin getting more and more information from Balin as, you know, because she's so wide-eyed. Whatever he reveals, you see Ivana Sakno be like, what? And what else? And tell me more. And so she's got real interest in finding out more about Balin's thing. And Balin clearly trying to mold her into something he wants her to be, to represent his legacy of breaking the wheel. He's like the original rebel. He wants to shatter it all, man, and see if there's a better way to make it function. And he wants her to represent that. I've seen some people push back on the Great Jedi moniker. I don't understand that. I like the Great Jedi moniker. So for me, it works. And this is absolutely Great Jedi stuff. So to me, this works with what they're creating here. We'll see where it goes. Yeah. And then that final scene setting it up. And I wonder if that world between worlds conversation between Ahsoka and uh, Anakin will allow her to overcome anything that Thrawn is going to try to do to mess with her about Anakin 
once he finds out that she's uh, he's her master. So I like that we're kind of piecing things together. But I'm with you, Mike and Shannon. There's 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 some stuff to flesh in here, and we need to flesh it in and answer some questions over the next two episodes. And we'll see about that. Um, one last question I have for you all is from one of the people who follow us and uh, wanted to ask us a question. Uh, it is uh, from um, uh, uh, was it, uh, Tim Sim. It says, I kind of wonder if Thrawn... No, no, where is it? Sorry, sorry guys, I lost it a little bit. Uh, yeah, oh, it's the two dope boys. Sorry. What do you think the chances are the Great Mothers drop a reference to Marin from the Star Wars Jedi games as she is also one of the last surviving Night Sisters, along with Morgan? What are your thoughts on this, my man? Or, or Shannon and, and Michael. I mean, I think uh, chances are low. Okay. Um, only because, you know, I mean, this show is already having to do a lot of heavy lifting with the characters that are in it. Yeah, yeah. As far as like, let's make sure that there's context. Let's make sure everything is understood. So throwing in like Marin, just because like we all know that she's out there, uh, it, it adds an element that could be confusing in something that is already, I think, potentially confusing for certain viewers. Yeah. So I think they won't do it now. Now, look, maybe down the road, just like we've now done with Ahsoka and Zeb and Hera and everybody yeah. else. Like, if this all continues to move forward, maybe we do get some of the characters from the uh, from Fallen Order and Survivor popping mm -hmm. up when when appropriate. And I would I would love to see Marin. Um, but I think that probably we won't get a mention, at least in this season. Yeah, agree. Uh, Shannon, anything to add to that? Having not played, fit, having not finished those games, I actually am unaware of this character. <laughs> so, maybe? Fair enough, fair enough. One last one. First Rate Nate says, the look of Galaxy Hyperdrive was gorgeous. Such a cool, different look. Then the entire atmospheric feel of this planet slash galaxy felt different like it should, but still in this Star Wars and yeah, as soon as they make action figures of Thrawn's Night Trooper fleet, I am broke. So I just wanted to kind of throw that. I thought that was funny. As well. um, yeah. I do think, just speaking of that Night Trooper fleet, like mm -hmm. between the Night Troopers and the fact that they look like they were loading up a bunch of coffins into that. Uh, yeah, what's in the cargo? Into, that, into, the yeah. car, into the Chimera. I am pretty sure that the Maroke bit, when we were all like, you know, who's Maroke, who's Maroke? And then he just kind of pup, literally disappeared in a puff of smoke. Really does seem like he was there, as Shannon kind of alluded to, mm. to set up what we now have. Yes. That like, right. if we yeah. start mowing down these stormtroopers in the next couple episodes and they all burst into smoke, we've now, we've been set up for right. it. So it's not going to be like, what the fuck is going on? So I do think Maroke was probably a good... Uh, Let's ease everybody into what we're about to do because yeah. we go in, we go in zombie troopers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's actually where they're going. It seems like. All right. Well, there you go. That's our review here of episode six of Ahsoka far, far away. Thank you all so much for joining us, whether you're watching us or listening to us on the podcast feed. We do have a podcast feed. Please subscribe to that channel. What do we have to tell them? Yeah, if you'd like to follow us on social media on Twitter, it's at geek underscore buddies on Instagram at the underscore geek underscore buddies. If you'd like to follow me on social media on Twitter, it's at Shannon underscore McClung on Instagram at Shannon the Geek Buddy. If you would like to follow Mr. Vogel, it is at MK Tune. If you would like to follow Mr. Roca, it is at the Roca Says. Mikey? Look, if you like talking folklore, mythology, and Hu Yang stories, uh, one, two, and three, we're going to talk about all of it here on Geek Buddies. So here's what you can do for us. You can hit that like button below, subscribe to Johnny's Outlaw Nation page, leave your comments below. What do you think of this episode? What do you think of Peridia? Where do you think we're going? What do you love? What do you hate? Tell us below. If you're listening to us on the podcast feed, go ahead and leave us some stars and some comments so we go up in the rankings and more people can find us. And as always, the best thing that you can do is retweet this video, post it on your socials, send it to your friends, and Tell them to hang out with your buddies, the Geek Buddies. There you go. All right, y'all are awesome. Thanks so much for watching this or listening to us. And we'll talk to you next week. With And don't forget about our main show coming up later on this week. But we'll definitely talk to you next week with another brand new spoiler review episode of Ahsoka. Here from the Geek Buddies. <gasps> hey!